the lights come on. The valley's opening act begins in the middle of the dry season near the banks of the Luangwa River. The showground, a grove of ebony trees. The principal characters, a troop of yellow baboons. The first performers, the juvenile comedians that bring the carnival to life. All fairs need a ringmaster, a leader who keeps order in the ranks, the troop commander, the biggest, fiercest, dominant male. His high position, a sought-after privilege often challenged by rogue outsiders. In this case, a rival male with serious intentions to depose the leader at any cost. The females of this troop make up the chorus. They engage in the usual activities of baboon society. A definite pecking order exists among them. Rank being a privilege inherited from birth, not gained by strength. They take interest and invest time in the opposite sex. Befriend a male and have a bodyguard for the season. And a mother's club, where membership extends only to females with infants. Two of them produced the troop commander's latest offspring. A black-furred baby, the typical color of newborns. and a white-furred baby, the carrier of a rare gene. The half-brothers, the troop's youngest and most precious possessions, and the heirs of this long lineage of the valley's master survivors. The odd-looking pair attracts much interest. And when the rough handling from their older cousins gets too much to bear, mothers step in. The cast shares the showground with Luangwa's gentle giants as well as some disruptive characters. Several crew members act out useful chores. The Puku and Impala's work behind the scenes makes their presence special. They perform as guards and warn the troop of danger. The troop's most feared enemy makes an appearance. The troop commander stands his ground. Now that the leopard has lost the element of surprise, she doesn't stand a chance of catching breakfast. But all good things come to those with patience and cunning. The guards on the outskirts of the ebony grove sound another alarm. The troop commander's brave act ends as the most powerful of the troop's enemies enters the scene. The Lord of the Land bypasses the grove, pausing only to survey the snitchers that made his presence known. 
Any one of them would make a healthy meal. The puku keep him in sight. To hunt them now would take too much effort for a lion on his own. In any case, he follows the trail of an airborne scent, an alluring odor drifting from the banks of the Luangwa River, a promise of instant food. The lords of the river have already started the banquet. They commandeer the proceedings. The lion moves into their turf. He needs to act with caution if he wants to share the spoils with such cunning opponents. The carcass is at least a week old, well matured beyond its due date, but the lion always welcomes a free meal. He even becomes possessive over his putrid portion. The lion tries his luck on the other side. This time he muscles his way in. The valley's supreme predators, the lords of land and river, squabble over the last rotting spoils of a decaying carcass. Hardly a feast worthy of a king. A dozen jaws against one set of claws. The lion retreats, defeated. But this is only the end of Act One of Luangwa's repertoire. The predator's turn for center stage is still to come. Act Two. The scene changes to the riverbanks. The cast warm up with a few routine social engagements. The troop commander patrols the showground. And the white baby gets a last grooming check from his mother before she allows him out to play. His half-brothers found a jungle gym. Born of the same father, and yet so different. The black baby's fur will eventually take on the golden sheen typical of yellow baboons, but his half-brother will not be so lucky. His white fur may not be enough to protect his skin from the sun later on in life. His miraculous rarity may become his own curse. For now, he represents one of the troop's precious heirs, and the only white one. Sporting their golden costumes, the juveniles, as usual, perform their foolish routine. Trivial as these games seem, they refine agility, speed, and all the senses, essential requirements for the ultimate survivors of this unforgiving valley. The troop commander mastered all these drills before he became the dominant male. 